This week, leaders from 30 member states will convene for the Organization of Islamic Cooperation's 13th Islamic Summit in Istanbul, Turkey. The meeting is being held by the second largest intergovernmental body in the world, second to the United Nations, and attendees will include President Recep Erdogan of Turkey, King Salman of Saudi Arabia, Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif of Pakistan, and Mahmoud Abbas of Palestine. The theme? unity and solidarity for justice and peace. And among their goals, they say, is to establish an international peace conference to help resolve what they call the Israeli-Palestine issue. The conference comes just as Human Rights Watch has released a new report finding instances of Israeli police arresting Palestinian children has more than doubled since October of last year, and cite lawyers as describing Israel's abuse of those children in prisons as endemic. To talk about Israel and Palestine a little bit more, I'm joined now with, let's talk now rather with Nico Paled. He's the author of The General's Son, Journey of an Israeli in Palestine, which is being re-released with an update on April 19th. Welcome, Miko. Um, let's talk about what's happening and in Israel and Palestine. In fact, uh, you just returned from Hebron in Palestine, where that shocking video, I think we can play for viewers, showing a soldier executing a wounded Palestinian man was filmed. Um, the man uh, had been accused of committing a stabbing attack, but he had already been subdued and could have been arrested. Instead, the soldier, as we can see, shoots him in the head. Is this an isolated incident? No, no, not at all. Israel has been, uh, <clears throat> Israeli soldiers are shooting young Palestinians and then claiming that they were about to stab all the time. This particular young man uh, was not, uh, you know, was not intending to stab anyone. He had his hands up when he was shot. There was he was another on the young, he, well, yeah. no, he was shot to the ground. Uh -huh. And then once he was on the ground, he was shot again and executed. So the initial shooter is really the one that you should be, we should be questioning. Why was he shot when he was clearly had, he had no intentions and no signs of attacking anyone? And his hands were up. But he was shot in the stomach, went to the ground. We saw several ambulances driving by, completely ignoring him. Um, and then this other young soldier shows up on the scene, talks to an officer, hands this officer his helmet, and then goes forward to shoot this young man. And the officer is watching him the whole time. So either it was done by consent or it was done as a result of being given an order to shoot this young man. But this is policy. I mean, this has been going on. Israeli, young Palestinians are being killed by Israeli soldiers all the time like this. And the shoot to kill policy is well documented. But we see, um, like you said, videos all the time coming out of, of young Palestinians being shot. What do you say to viewers who say, maybe not this guy, but we have seen multiple stabbing attacks committed by Palestinians um, and that this is an issue? What do you want them to understand about why these attacks are happening? Well, if anybody has any questions about that, I suggest they go to Hebron or they go to Gaza or they go to Jerusalem, East Jerusalem, live as Palestinians do, have the same encounters and the same experiences that Palestinians have with Israeli soldiers, and then see if they wouldn't do the same. I think the question is not so much why, do, why, does this, why this happens. It's the question is, how is it that it happens so rarely? So few attacks, you know? And really, a large percentage of the claims that Israel makes that these were attacks are not attacks. These are young men or young women that are being killed. Uh, and then they say, yes, but they were going to attack, or we thought they were going to attack, or they had a knife or a comb or God knows what. Um, so many of them were not even intending. And this young man was not even intending to do anything. Well, you just got back from Hebron. Yeah. Give viewers a picture of what it is like to be a Palestinian there. What is your daily experience like with the Israeli soldiers? Well, living in the center of Hebron, in the old city of Hebron, it, it, it is insane, the limitations on where Palestinians may or may not go because settlers live there. Um, I, the house of Issa Amro, who heads the Youth Against Settlements, which is really the human rights watch, so to speak, of Palestinians in Hebron, um, his house has been declared a closed military zone, so he can go into his house, but nobody can visit him. And all the houses in his neighborhood in this area have been taken by settlers who are who are protected by the soldiers, and then the settlers go on and harass and push and beat the Palestinians. It's an impossible situation, and people are afraid for their lives. Palestinians are afraid for their lives all the time. In Israel, the response to this video has been to really rally behind and support the soldier uh, who 
we saw um, uh, shot this man. In fact, there were rallies across the country um, held in support of him. One was held in his hometown of uh, Ramla, and the mayor was actually interrupted by residents uh, chanting death to leftists and BB go home. Uh, that was at a rally supporting uh, the soldier. And actually, journalists Dan Cohen and David Sheen attended that very rally. Uh, we can listen to what one man who took over the mic had to say. You'd think from the way that he's talking that uh, Netanyahu and his defense minister Moshe Yalon are peace activists. But, I mean, is this kind of mentality common in Israel? And if it is, what does that say about where the society has moved politically? Well, Israeli society is very racist. There's very little dissent uh, in Israeli society. Uh, they always claim that they're under attack, that Palestinians are attacking them, and these poor soldiers are just doing their job following orders and the soldier was merely you know doing what he was supposed to do which is killing a terrorist so besides the fact that this entire argument is is not true is based on a lie the actual accusation and the actual attempt to charge this particular soldier is really a joke and in a way you can sympathize with the people who are saying why are you accusing him he is he is right. the pawn in a long chain of of command that expected him to do this and we can see in the video that he was cons you know he was talking to an officer before stepping forward and, and doing this so he had either consent or he was given an order to do this and he's really the the, the you know the, the lowest man on the totem pole so to speak but but the but the feeling is that why do we need to stop anybody from killing a Palestinian there's nothing wrong with that it was interesting I was at APAC a few weeks ago and was talking to a guy from Texas who is a big supporter of Israel just an American guy and he said I suggest I want anybody any American to go to Israel and they tell us here that it's so unsafe but it's a great country you know it's very uh, safe and secure and I thought oh that seems to contradict actually what a lot of people say in trying to justify these kinds of attacks we have about a minute left Migo but I wanted to ask you you know this kind of analysis that you're bringing isn't coming just from any other peace activist I mean your father uh, founded the Israeli army you've written about it how does what's uh, happened uh, in the last few months and even last few years in Israel inform your own story well, you know, m mine is a journey of an Israeli who comes from, like you say, a very Zionist Israeli family, a very patriotic Israeli family, and took a journey to, the, to see the Palestinian side and learn that the Palestinian story is true and the Israeli story is a lie. Uh, it's a journey that never ends. I mean, the, the, the things that I learn, the things that I see, never cease to, to, never cease to, surprise, uh, never cease to surprise me. The story about the hospitals, for example, the racism in the hospitals, you know, this is something that's been going on for years. Um, and is policy? You is, were just is, you were mentioning is, when you were is, watching. It is informal policy. It is the reality. It is informal policy in hospitals. So now that I've kind of stepped away from the inside of the Israel society and slightly lo looking from the outside, the, 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 it's shocking, you know. And any talks about trying to bring a peace between Israel and the Palestinians is absurd because Israel will never allow peace to happen. We can have peace between Israelis and Palestinians in a non-Israel, in a non-Zionist, non-apartheid regime that will hopefully come soon but Israel is will never allow that to happen and Israeli society is a deeply racist society well you write all about uh, about your experience in your book uh, the general son like I said a new edition coming out April 19th Miko thanks for your time thank you